Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I am Sonia Leung, and I am the co-president of Women in Real Estate Development. And today, we have a very special guest joining us, Sabrina Canner. She is the executive vice president of Brookfield Properties for development, design, and construction. She has been with Brookfield Properties and its predecessor, Olympia in New York, since 1982, and has played a key role in the construction, design, and development of over 40 million square feet of construction, uh, including the World Financial Center, Brookfield Place, 300 Madison Avenue, Bay Adelaide Center, and the restoration and renovation of Winter Garden at the World Financial Center after 9-11. And currently Manhattan West, which we have displayed up behind us, Greenport Landing, Bankside, The Yards, and Haley Rise, just to name a few. She is the member of the National Academy of Construction and WX and sits on the board of directors of the New York Building Congress, the Salvadori Center, the Opus Group, Regional Plan Association, Urban Green Council, Cedar Realty Trust, Columbia University Center for Building Infrastructure and Public Space, and the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. Shedding light on her early days and the inspirational path she has paved, she majored in English with a liberal arts degree and started in payroll, estimating financial reporting. She worked her way up from junior estimator senior estimator, project manager, and chief estimator. During her time at Olympia, New York, the company went bankrupt on Cannery Wharf, which was then taken over by Brookfield, and Sabrina rode the recession in the 90s when Brookfield was only 30 to 40 people, and now Brookfield has over 700 billion of assets under management. Winter Garden is one of her favorite projects, which was built after 9-11, as this demonstrated the strength and resilience of the community coming together and giving back a jeweled box of public space. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you, Sabrina, for being here. And I know it's not a small feat or a small thing to be here. No, but thank you for asking me. I'm pleased to be here. So, so for the broader group, um, so we have a roadmap of what will be discussed. I have a number of topics that I want to cover with Sabrina. We will start with the macro environment where, and then where Brookfield is going. Then we'll talk about monetary policies, then shift to sustainability and local law 97, diversity and the unconscious bias of women in the workplace, and round it up on a discussion of leadership, scaling up, and technology. So let's dive right in. Lots of ground to cover. Can you share your thoughts on what's going on in the macro environment as we look at today's world? We're in a very challenging environment with rising interest rates, geopolitical issues, rising construction costs, supply chain issues, inflation, and a potential recession looming over. How does what you see today translate into Brookfield's investment philosophy and how it's the same or how it's different from five years ago? Okay. I think that's really six questions, but <laughs> let's, let's start. Let's start. Um, the bad news is um, we're not putting a lot of new shovels in the ground. This is not a great time to develop. Um, and, and that's not just Brookfield. That's across the country, really. Um, having said that, both boom and bust bring opportunities. And it's interesting to note, we have always said conventional wisdom tells you that there is a downturn in the real estate market every approximately seven years. We skipped one. We haven't really had a downturn in the real estate market for about 14 years, mm -hmm. which leaves a whole cohort of people like yourselves who have never experienced that. And what I'm seeing in some of the younger people at Brookfield, some are petrified. They're petrified, and, and that's valid. Um, others are clueless. Um, the truth is really somewhere in the middle. Um, you should be feeling both of these things. Again, when there's change, any change in real estate brings opportunity, and opportunity to make money. So you just have to be aware, have to pivot, 
be flexible and ready to, to actually act on the opportunities that present themselves. Um, on the other hand, you should be reassured that every time the market comes back, every time. So as you heard, I'm with my company or the predecessor company for 40 years this year. Um, it always comes back. It never hasn't. So reassuring. We all need real estate. We will always need real estate. Um, what is Brookfield doing in response to this? Um, while not putting a lot of new shovels in the ground, um, there is a division of Brookfield that's chasing debt investment. So we have uncertain times and very high rates, uh, very high interest rates, and lots of opportunity for risk-adjusted returns that, that we are chasing. I'm not chasing them. Don't ask me a question about it. I get every once in a while I get asked to, to weigh in on a property that, that the debt is being bought for. Um, and happy to do that, but not my specialty. Um, I would also say, and this, while it's true in any economic climate, um, is especially true now and will become even more so um, over the next year. There are plenty of public companies out there whose NAV of their real estate assets or real assets far outvalue the face value of their stock price. And um, you heard, I, I was on the board of Cedar Realty Trust. It was sold off just within a construct like this. They pulled the assets apart because the stock price was going nowhere. It was going down, 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 down. Pulled the entire portfolio apart and sold it off in three tranches and made multiples of the value, the face value of the share price. So, um, so I'm not on that board anymore, but with good, with good mm -hmm. results. Um, and as we see stock market is depressed, we're going to see many more opportunities like this present themselves over the next year. So we are on the lookout for those. Um, anybody who's interested in real estate should be doing the same. Mm -hmm. I would also say, while um, we're not developing a lot, we are developing and choosing those projects which we call conviction projects, that there are enough fundamentals that are hanging together, even in times like this, where you can move them forward. Uh, they do tend to come with their own debt that we can expand or extend, that we can work with, or something that we can close with cash. Um, and we do plan to start something in the next few months, we hope. Um, and beyond that, we don't really chase a particular sector or a particular geography. Mm -hmm. We pretty much stay open. Um, one exception to that, we do have a logistics division, and that sector is strong. That's industrial slash logistics. Um, still quite a bit of strong tenant rental interest and plenty of room for rental growth. So we're continuing to, to build those. So I know you mentioned that you don't chase a specific asset or a geography, but the current conviction projects, are you able to shed some light on what those asset types are? One is multifamily. Multifamily, there's still very strong demand. The problem that we see there, um, it, it, the headwinds, don't allow them necessarily to, to pencil out. And if we look at New York City in particular, and it's not unusual, um, the situation we're in here is not unusual or particular to New York City, policy does not support it. So um, as you may or may not know, multifamily product is disproportionately taxed. And so without a tax credit or a revision to the tax law, you just cannot achieve the returns that the risk requires. Um, and unfortunately, in, a, in New York right now, our elected bodies are, are really quite left. And I say that with full appreciation. I'm very left myself. Um, but when it comes to real estate, there's an unrealistic belief that developers will build or develop at a lower return at some point. No recognition 
it's very rare for a developer to develop with their own equity, right? We raise, we raise our capital and we raise it explaining to people what, giving an approximate risk adjusted return. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the expectation and there's <coughs> not a lot of movement for us there. Can you share about what you're seeing in office? Is there a move for tenants that are already in Class A office to move to more trophy office products? Absolutely, there's a flight to quality. Um, as we came through the pandemic, very nervous. Um, we had two Manhattan West, which was really just early days of, mm -hmm. of development, of construction. Um, we had really just started 660 Fifth Avenue, which is a repositioning um, on Fifth Avenue, the old 666 Fifth Avenue. We had unpeeled that thing. It was pretty much a mess, and we were very nervous. What we saw was that those two projects in particular leased up. I think two Manhattan West, which will be substantially complete next May, is over 80% leased mm -hmm. today. I think I actually looked at the comps um, in the investor presentation on Manhattan West and to just shed some light for all of you that don't know, it's this project behind us. It is seven buildings, seven million square feet of mixed use development slated for completion in May 2023. It costs 7.1 billion to develop. It has a 10.2 billion stabilized value, 6% yield in cost, 3.1 billion in development profit. 97% office occupancy, 96% rental occupancy, 99% residential occupancy, and it has 100% renewable energy. So what in that project made it so successful? Was it, maybe you can speak to the amenities, the design, the, and, 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 you, and also share, you were in construction during COVID, and yet you still can make this great project work. Yeah, so I mean, I think this project is a great example of long-term investment in high-quality value creation, um, which is something that we always believed in. And it's, it's really, at that point, just Matt, the compounding creates, creates great value if you're holding on to it. Um, I also, and anyone who's ever heard me speak before, a big believer that design matters. Design really matters. Um, it's central, and, and when I say design, it's not just color picking, it's sustainability, it's great engineering, it's future proofing, it's, it's all of that. It's what makes the actual physical product appealing today and appealing in the long run. So we've got a great design staff that manages that forward. Um, these kinds of projects, I think we happen to be especially good at campus type projects. Mm -hmm. We just have had more experience, frankly, than others. Um, other campus type projects, we've got Greenpoint Landing in Brooklyn. We're developing in the South Bronx, um, Bankside which just won a ULI Award of Excellence last night. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Um, the Yards in Washington, Haley Rise in Washington. So we enjoy placemaking and kind of leaning into to the control of the design mm -hmm. and really making it a place that will attract and hold people and, and continue to attract people in, in for years to come. Mm -hmm. Amenities, yes. Mm -hmm. Sustainability, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and tenants are willing to pay for that premium? Uh, commercial office tenants are not yet on the multifamily rental side. I think there's a personal perception of transiency, and this isn't mine, and uh, you know, at the same price point, I think they would take it. Um, but we don't get asked about it. Mm -hmm. um, commercial office tenants will always ask. And they want to know, they know their employee base wants to know. What are you doing about resiliency? What are you doing about decarbonization? Um, and, and they want to turn and share that with their employee base because the employee base cares. Mm -hmm. so. so the next topic, and you touched on it, is monetary policy and its effect on the real estate market and attempts to get inflation under control. What is your view on what policy makers should be doing and how we can improve the economy? 
Okay, so I, I'm not an economist. Mm -hmm. I am a developer. So if you ask a, an economist what they, I mean, an economist will tell you the glass is half empty. A developer will tell you the glass is overflowing. So you have to kind mm -hmm. of take that into consideration. But we do have to get inflation under control because I think it is directing personal choice. I think it is affecting decision making. And so that's something that while it's going to be very painful in the near term is a necessary pain that we have to, that we have to absorb. Um, do you think there should be more government intervention on like tax credits, tax abatements? Yep. Um, yep. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. There should be, although it has to be weighed in where those tax credits belong. As I mm -hmm. mentioned, the great place is multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, but too much, of course, runs counter to inflation fighting mm -hmm. mechanisms. So, so we have to be careful judicial about that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next is sustainability. Brookfield's sustainability goals include zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, 50% core office decarbonization by 2030, and 100% core retail and office assets with ESG certification, to name a few. Can you share what your team is doing specifically in meeting these goals and how government policies such as Local Law 97 influence your decisions? Sure. So. Uh, Anything that we're designing forward is largely electrified, right? Mm -hmm. No more natural gas. There is some dissonance there because we do need a certain amount of resiliency and so to be completely dependent on electricity runs counter to that and we haven't quite worked that through. Um, renewable energy, clean renewables is big and as you mentioned, we have clean renewables delivered to one Manhattan West, will be to two Manhattan West. Having said that, that at the moment is through blockchain because we can't quite get there. Clean path should be open, and forgive me, I forget now, but certainly five to seven years from now, we hope. Um, and the grid is in the midst of greening as well as steam offerings from, from Con Ed. So um, plenty to run with there. Uh, Local Law 97 is forcing people to open their eyes. And I think the Brookfields of the world, the large developers are ahead of this, have been working on this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, it's smaller building stock owners, it's um, smaller developers that, that will be, really their hand will be pushed in order to meet our goals, our New York City goals, the New York State goals, um, and I think it's a great thing. And, and look, the, I'm chair of the board at Urban Green. Urban Green was instrumental in enacting Local on 97 um, or advising City Hall to the extent that they, they could, to, to the extent that other cities are now reaching out to Urban Green and saying, help us do this in Los Angeles, help us do this in Denver, help us. They've done a lot of great work, and for anyone in our class, I definitely suggest going on their website. There's a lot of free resources um, that teaches us about what we could be doing in sustainable design and, and development. Thanks for that plug. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> it, I mean, they're great. They convene people. They they help you know garner consensus. They educate. They acknowledge. They act as a, a Springboard as a sounding board for policymakers, um, and it, it's really a great organization and and sort of an undercover power um, mm -hmm. in the sustainability movement, especially here in New York. Um, so, I, I, big believer in, in local law ninety seven. Yeah, is there a minimum standard when you're looking at design? Like, take for example. Um, looking at deep water cooling systems, heat pumps, triple glaze, windows, ins like improving your R value of insulation. Like, what are the minimum that that you implore in your design? It, you know, every building is different. Every it depends on the typology and it depends on the location as well. We we are probably moving towards triple glazing everything today. We're not there. We don't need to. Mm -hmm. um, and as we improve all facets 
of a building and how we design and how we build a, a building, how we operate a building. Um, I think all of this changes. It was, for instance, very eye-opening for us. We began doing repositioning, and we've been doing repositionings actually for, for many years, but really a concerted effort to repurpose a building uh, maybe eight years ago, the mm -hmm. first, yeah, maybe a little bit longer than that, first one in New York City was the building we now call Five Manhattan West, was 450 West 33rd Street, and it had beautiful structures, crazy looking building, and we made fun of it all the time. It was complete, d directly adjacent to um, Manhattan West, and we used to call it the elephant's foot. It, it was the biggest joke running, and then came in one day on a Monday, found out our CEO had bought it over the weekend and said, you know, just see what you can do with it. <laughs> um, but it had gorgeous structure, it had waffle cement, you know, waffle concrete structure um, that everyone had covered with old acoustic tiles, and um, but just beautiful. And we peeled it, we optimized the mechanical systems, didn't even replace it all. We, we really just reorganized a lot of it, replaced some that was at the end of life and put a ton of controls on it. We put variable speed pumps and fans and all kinds of, of controls, state-of-the-art BMS, the building maintenance system, and we improved the energy efficiency on this building by 50% in peak months. Um, fast forward, we, we did a similar, similar effort at 1100 Avenue of the Americas, and of course we're now doing it at 660 Fifth Avenue. Between those three buildings, we have saved 55,000 metric tons of embodied carbon by leaving their structures. Mm -hmm. That's enormous, that's impactful. And in addition, by changing out the, the mechanical systems and adding all these controls, we are saving 12,000 metric tons of carbon, of operational carbon every year. That is also impactful. So this wow. is super, super exciting stuff to me. Mm -hmm. But how you solve for every building really depends on that building. We know, um, for instance, uh, multifamily, we're looking to heat pumps, mm -hmm. right? Heat pumps are, are really the future, electrifying, but um, energy efficiency. Well, zoning also pushes you to the limits. and over a certain height, heat pumps don't always make sense either. So that we still have, have a lot to, mm -hmm. to unpack there and a lot to solve for, and, yeah. and the industry is working hard to do that. Yeah. So it seems like um, you use a lot of technology to make your decisions and push that design parameter, as you had mentioned, on the saving of embod embodied carbons. Can you also share how you have used technology to make other strategic decisions if it's not in the actual building system? Um, is it in the use of big data or what other ways you use technology? Yeah, um, you know, really, I would say the best use of technology is optimizing buildings mm -hmm. still to this day. We do collect data um, and are building a dashboard to help us locate for instance, um, likely candidates for repurposing or um, repositioning. Um, but they're very crude, of course, it's, you know, it's the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. You're only as good as, as the data that goes in and how that data is filtered and how it's paired up with other data. So that's not perfect yet, or it hasn't been reliably perfect. Um, but we do use, for instance, in most of our new commercial office buildings, we're using a software called Willow Twin. And it's a digital twin of the building. And what this does is actually you can pull out an iPad. All of our, our building engineers now run around with iPads instead of flashlights and wrenches. Um, <laughs> but every piece of equipment can be found um, on, on your digital twin. And if something is not operating optimally, it shows up. And it will also tell you if that piece of equipment is still under warranty. Um, and if it is, what's the phone number to call? Um, if it's not under warranty, what's the phone number to call? And so we optimize our operations and we optimize our energy use, our energy efficiency. And we're already seeing return on investment there. Very cool. So very exciting, yeah. 
So shifting to the topic of women in real estate and the opportunity for more women representation in the executive management level. Sabrina, you are one of the most prominent female leaders in the real estate industry. How are you continuing to lead Brookfield's team towards a more inclusive and diverse team? And what insight would you impart with us in getting those challenging assignments and leadership opportunities? Okay, so, so again, I think that's two or three questions, but let me start. Um, so, what was the first? <laughs> How are you leading Brookfield uh, to yes. have a more inclusive and diverse yeah, team? Yeah, I think when we're hiring, um, the hiring pool, first of all, we have to be extremely mindful. We need to make sure, be very purposeful, very deliberate, that we are seeking out people of color, women, um, and it's not just dialing it in. I mean, you have to be pretty muscular in your assembly of your hiring pool. And um, anybody who says, they're just not out there, is just not doing the work. So, um, in Brookfield, if you actually look at the statistics, we have, we actually have slightly more women than men. Mm -hmm. um, we have have a very high percentage of executive women, and that doesn't come by accident. Um, and, and look, I would tell you too, first of all, whatever insight to impart, if you love real estate, you should do what you love, because your chances of succeeding are far greater if you're passionate about what you do. I'm here, right? Yeah. Um, and there are meritocracies out there so plenty of companies that will recognize success and reward success with more work and more opportunities. Um, and be bold, be creative, be bold, be yourself, have confidence in, in your own voice, mm -hmm. um, which is not global sort of advice, it's really personal advice, but um, not always easy to, to, to take. Um, so speaking of finding your voice, how, how, what advice would you give to us coming out of this program to, to stake out our place while still staying true to yourself? Yeah, um, I, again, I think you should think creatively. You really push yourself to think outside of the box. Um, while people believe that development is formulaic, the real success stories are outside formulas, right? Um, they're the buildings you remember, the buildings that you can't forget even. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great saying, I, I love this saying, um, and I think it's actually Canadian Native American, but um, sometimes the river is the bridge. The idea that the solution is sometimes found within the problem. If you pull it apart, you really think about it, and you just blow your mind a little bit, open up, um, that you will find the answer, the solution that nobody else has thought of. And, and that's the solution that's gonna bring you success. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, how about, uh, if, if you could share if you have ever experienced unconscious bias as a woman in the workplace, and how you may have managed that. Yeah, um, yes, of course. Um, as a matter of fact, it sort of makes me uh, reminisce a little bit and, and really long for the days when it was conscious. So just to give you an example, when I first became a project manager and I begged and begged and begged for the opportunity to run a project decades ago and was finally given the shot um, one of my colleagues, a man, came up to me and said, I have to tell you, I disagree with you being awarded this opportunity because you've taken an opportunity away, uh, away from a man who's a breadwinner. And I was, I was shocked. I was shocked. I thought I had worked so hard and really, I mean, had really worked hard and really begged a lot for this opportunity, but finally got it. And it took me a second, and here we had, all my colleagues were around me, and everyone's kind of looking at, this is what he said, what are you gonna say, what are you gonna say? Um, and I finally said, so the CEO should be the man with the most children? 
let's agree to disagree, and you move on. And, and I would say so, humor goes a long way. I think most, people, most people's hearts are in the right place, and so you diffuse your humor. It gives someone a chance to hear you and listen. Um, unconscious bias still here. Mm -hmm. um, even to this day, the, the, what happens to me on a regular basis still, you know, regular is relative, but um, I'll say, why don't we make that chair blue? And maybe a heartbeat later, the man says, you know what, maybe we'll make that chair blue. And everyone says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, didn't I just say that? You know? <laughs> that happens to me still. Mm -hmm. That still happens to me. Um, so then how can we normalize the conversation that women are not necessarily asked the same questions as men or are given the same opportunities? Where do we begin? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I speak a lot and I speak to emerging leaders groups and often it just devolves into, okay, this was said to me, what do I say back? Literally, what do I say back? Um, how do you normalize the conversation? Again, humor, again, understanding that most people are not deliberately, mm -hmm. not recognizing you. Um, and so without being plaintive or just say, you know, I, I really appreciate it when you do recognize me. And speaking in the positive, again, is a great way to have people hear you. Mm -hmm. You come back to someone with a negative comment, they don't hear you. They shut you down, they shut you down. Um, the other thing I would say is organically, the conversation is normalizing. Um, the same way that, you know, I used to come in, they'd say, um, can we all get together tomorrow at, at 7.30 in the morning? Let's meet early. And I'm like, I, I, you know, and I, I'm sorry, it's, you know, you know, our turn to bring cupcakes. And I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, a man would never say that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to retrain ourselves as women to not apologize. Um, but at the same time, the, the conversation is shifting because it is now men who are needing time to stay home with family. And that whole paradigm has shifted. We have paternity leave. And you guys want to be with your families as much as, as it was expected that we would be home with ours. And so over time, and this is a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. This is really a long-term goal. And I say to people all the time, young women, pick the right partner, men pick the right partner, and this is not gonna be solved today, so let's raise good partners. Mm -hmm. The key to our daughter's successes is our son, mm -hmm. our son. So um, train your children to depend upon one another, to look to operate as a, as a unit and as a partnership. Mm -hmm. All your points really resonate with me, and leading to that is, is we can talk about leadership and how you discern between the noise of what's happening in the market or in the news and what's important in making your decision. Like, do you trust your gut or how do you develop that gut that you can make that decision? Yeah, I'm, I'm fair answer, but a lot of it is experience. Mm -hmm. um, and experience working for a real estate company that really values long-term investment. So as you design for long-term value, you have an eye toward uh, or away from fashion or fad and really toward what holds value in the long term, whether it be sustainability, energy efficiency, a classic lobby, um, social spaces, people always want to be together. There are certain fundamentals and there, again, design is so important, design really matters when mm -hmm. we're talking about long-term goal mm -hmm. and someone who can guide the process to, uh, to something that won't be phased out mm -hmm. in five years. Mm -hmm. And what traits do you have that has enabled you to have success in your career? Uh, I think creative, creativity and enjoying creativity um, and sense of humor, for sure. <laughs> and I love people, I love people. Yeah. Um, 
So, and I think that shows real estate is a team sport. Mm -hmm. uh, we rely upon each other. Nothing happens without 10 people, mm -hmm. right? So you should enjoy people if you're in this um, and enjoy every day. And, and It's such a collaborative process. It like is. You never work with just, just the architects or just the engineers. You're mm -hmm. working with a huge range of people from financiers to legal people to engineering, design, your property management, leasing, like it's just, I, I think that's what makes this particular industry very interesting. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So you never get pegged into one silo. You can, mm -hmm. but don't. You shouldn't. You get to reach out and, and speak to all these different disciplines mm -hmm. and be exposed to so much. It's so exciting. Mm -hmm. So as we're all figuring out our career path, um, there, there's rumblings that some people are like, oh, I should go into finance and then I go to development or do development, then I can't go back into finance. What is your opinion on that? Well, I think it's sort of difficult to say because what I would say in a perfect world is choose your horse and ride it. Um, I've been in the same company basically for 40 years, which is the antithesis of what most people do. Now, you see people jumping every couple of years for a title, for more money. Um, pick something that you love and stay with it. Mm -hmm. um, I tell people all the time when I'm hiring, if you haven't started a project and seen it through to the end, you don't know, you haven't learned everything that you, that's been made available to you, and you are less valuable for it. Um, so invest the time mm -hmm. and stick with something. Uh, and. I'm a great example. I stood still and everything changed around me, mm -hmm. right? So, um, Can you uh, share if when, as, as you progressed through your career, did you have a sponsor? And if you didn't have a sponsor, is there an importance of finding the right sponsor? When you say sponsor, I'm, I'm taking that as mentor. Mentor, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did. I had a great, great mentor. Um, this was back when I was in Olympia, New York. And by rights, this guy should have been the most out of whack person ever. He was a war orphan from World War II um, and just the most balanced human being and had this wonderful marriage with his wife who was a doctor. He was Canadian, so she was in the Canadian medical system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially, for women, you know, the tendency is to say, I, as a woman, I need a woman mentor. As a person of color, I need a person of color to mentor me. Not true, not true. And very often there's a strength in seeking someone other than yourself because you only learn the sound of that confidence from somebody who has it. And it may not be you, it may not be another woman, it may not be, it, and it, it's very personal. There has mm -hmm. to be a chemistry. There has to be a real respect, admiration. It has to be someone that you want to emulate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how much of that is a two-way street? A lot, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, my mentor, I actually had a conversation with him like three weeks ago. He's 93 now. Mm -hmm. um, and we just had a, a really special um, a really special bond. I remember he came to me one day and I was very young project manager and um, this was when World Financial Center was coming out of the ground which is also Brookfield Place if you don't know that so I get like double double credit <laughs> it's really the, the same project but um, I did renovate it um, and Prices were going out, really spinning out of control. And this was Olympia, New York, who self-performed. So I, I worked for our own construction company and eventually ran one of our own construction companies. And he said, what do we do? What are we doing wrong? And the problem, in my view, was nobody was accountable. Mm -hmm. We weren't responsible. They had so siloed everybody that construction push paperwork around, but somebody else was doing the accounting, somebody else was doing something else. You had no idea if you were within your budget. Mm -hmm. And so we shifted that all around and prices all came in. And so he said, I thank you, mm -hmm. I thank you. 
had a great accent. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, That's great. So speaking of accountability and its relation of scaling up. So you started off with Olympian in New York, went, and then in the beginning times when it's Brookfield, 30, 40 people to what it is today. How do you ensure that that accountability is still maintained as you're growing? And, and maybe the power of Brookfield's platform and its, how big of that reach is yeah. as a benefit. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you maintain accountability? Accountability really, um, I think, resides, the, the tone of accountability resides with the manager. So you, again, personal voice and how you lead your team and let people know, and, and by the way, they appreciate this. People want to be accountable. They want the responsibility, and you must be, there's no joy in authority without accountability, and there's no fun in being having to be accountable if you don't have the authority. So people want to be in charge. People that are developers want to be in charge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, Playing into that and recognize what people's strengths are, make them accountable, um, and make them feel good about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not what, sure I answered all that question. Yeah, when when you were building your team as it was growing, how did you manage through those growing pains? Because you're you're probably acquiring different assets. I mean, there's different platforms. You have to integrate them. And there's different accounting systems. Like, how did that all pan out? Yeah, it, you know, we were lucky enough, and I was lucky enough to have found a rhythm that worked, and then as we acquired companies, we'd pull them in, and it, we might find a best practice or, or two or maybe more in that group. Mm -hmm. We'd incorporate them into our core group. So it wasn't um, just like Brookfield eating everything and being like, you're going to do it the Brookfield way. Yeah, was, no. For a, a great example of this, when we acquired Forest City in 2018, went down to Washington and, and we were all interviewing staff and, and understanding what they had, what they were doing, who was doing what. And they had this amazing program of um, social inclusion where they had a director of social inclusion who was pulling in community members, training them, finding them jobs, looking for local um, design consultants, contractors, and uh, wow, that, you know, as simple as it is, it's revolutionary. So brought them up to the Bronx, we're doing it there. We brought them down to Atlanta, we're doing it there. Um, so being open and understanding when there's, uh, there's something new that is exciting, that is positive, pulling it in, but holding on to what you know works. Um, our accounting systems were excellent much better than anybody else's, and maybe that goes back to my early days mm -hmm. of saying, I don't know where I am. We, we need to be accountable, and we need to understand where we are. So mm -hmm. holding on to best practices, but being open to picking up new ones. Mm -hmm. So in an environment like today, where there's so much uncertainty, are there any ways that Brookfield's scale has been a disadvantage, or it's been? Mm -hmm. All great. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, it you know, it's tough when you grow that fast. Just holding on to all the pieces, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we wake up and understand the left hand is doing the same thing the right hand is doing, and we really should be coordinating. And there's there's waste and lack of efficiency there. So a lot of communication is is needed. Um, and a lot of reaching out, which if, if you're in this field, you, you again, enjoy communicating. So um, making it known that you're interested in sustainability, for instance, and then reaching out to everybody who's interested in that and working on some front of that. So mm -hmm. um, it's a helpful way to stay ahead of it, but it is hard. Mm -hmm. It is hard, so. Well, I think that's a really great place to end. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you for your thoughts and your leadership. And thank you all for joining us today. We will now open the floor for questions. Uh, so uh, Katrina, if, if you have a question, there's a mic. Just raise your hand. 
So I have a question actually on sustainability. Um, you spoke a lot about how, you know, your, in, um, your projects have the great carbon savings. I was wondering how it's penciling out on a financial front, like what kind of payback periods we're seeing, whether or not at the moment it's financially feasible for smaller developers to implement. So it depends on the, the projects in particular that I was speaking about, the repositionings. They're, they are tricky. They are the most complicated you'll ever do because in most cases, these are buildings that we didn't build, we didn't lease, and we didn't maintain. So they're a mess, um, in my opinion. So we have to go and renegotiate access rights and all kinds of things. Um, having said that, because you're not building the infrastructure, you're not building the structure, superstructure rather, um, you're faster back to market, and that's how you balance that. And so we have done extremely well. Five Manhattan West, when we first had performed at that building, we were underwriting rents averaging $53, I think, a square foot. Um, and our leasing team said, you're crazy. Like, we're never gonna get that in this part of town now. Like, maybe in 20 years, but not now, not now. We signed our last lease and we leased up, the, the velocity was crazy. Um, we leased right up and the last lease was north of $100. So, so the opportunities are there and that's why I say think outside the box and sometimes the, the solution is not the easy solution. You're stretching and I have to go and, and say, okay, if you've ever seen the building, the curtain wall does this because the structure did this and, and kind of convincing people at the top, we're gonna go a little further here with the curtain wall and we're gonna go a little further here because that's our hook. We're in the middle of nowhere, that's our hook. And we said, okay, go, and it, and it worked. Um, complying with local on 97 is a different deal. Like, that is hard, that is very hard, and, and I'm actually on a working group for the city of New York on the economic impact, and this law will evolve. It's going to evolve for years. Um, very difficult, very difficult, and I think the, one of the most difficult things, too, is there's a lack of belief that the city is going to require this. I keep hearing, yeah, no, we're grandfathered, someone said to me. But, no, you're not, you're really not. Um, and so that is gonna be challenging. Having said that, the city is very open. If you can demonstrate hardship, they will work with you. And there are all kinds of programs in the city, the accelerator program, the gives you all kinds of resources to help you problem solve. If you really hit a wall, they, they will give you a loophole, but that's, you can't change the marble in your lobby and then say I'm out of money and I have hardship, that, that won't fly. You will, hit, you will get a penalty. But to your point, it, it, it needs a lot of thought. It needs smarter design, frankly. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for coming. Uh, my name is Omar, and my question goes more related to a personal uh, perspective. And one of the most, I mean, a lot of people right now are interviewing uh, for a lot of companies. And one of the questions that interviewers ask a lot is, where do you see yourself in five, 10, and 30 years? When you were interviewing for Brookfield, when you were starting your career, did you see yourself here as an executive VP? No, not at all, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, and I probably was asked that question. I'm trying to think what, what I would have said, but I probably said something like, I want your job. Because I did want to excel, I had no idea. And I had no idea that the company I'd be working for would also outstretch its wildest dreams too. So um, I think whatever you say, has to demonstrate the confidence you have in yourself and your desire not only to improve but to expand and to share that with the company you work with and work for. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think Aaron has a question at the back. If you could just wait for the mic. Hey, thank you so much. The, my name is Aaron and I really appreciate um, you know, the, 
perspective that you brought to the table here. And I just wanted to ask one question about green financing. And where do you think, or where do you feel that financing is going to move as we really try to layer in you know, sustainable design into our projects? And where do you see that space kind of unfolding over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I, I see a lot of improvement and expansion in, in that space. At the moment, it's um, a little too complicated. Some of the green financing that's out there requires that it is um, superior to any other financing, which is problematic on an exit, right? So that has to be solved. Um, and I know there are people out there working for it, but I, I think there is just such an enormous pressure to be sustainable and to invest money in that direction. This will get solved for sure. Um, and, and I also believe it, it requires the intervention of governments. Governments are really the biggest change agents we have. Nobody else has that power, that reach. Um, so I, I see the government stepping in and actually streamlining some of this, yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, my name's Jordan. Thank you for your presentation again. Um, so going back to the conversation earlier, you mentioned that given the current market environment, Brookfield is strategically pursuing debt investments at this time. So within the purview of your team, within development, design, and construction, what sorts of opportunities are you looking at during the interim period? Yeah, um, well, just to be clear, again, a debt investment, we get pulled in to, to look at a property where they're, they're buying a debt, right? Just to make sure that, in fact, this is a long-term value-holding product. Um, so we do a fair amount of that. Um, and occasionally, there have been times in the past through other downturns where we actually had to step in and finish a project. Um, so there's a role there. Um, Beyond that, I, and are you still specifically talking about debt investment or just uh, in no, general? No, oh, pursuits, I, yeah, I pursuing, will tell like, within you. Within the development space. All day long, all day long, we are looking into pursuits um, and understanding where our target markets are. It's, it's my belief that we do all this work right now and we do not see distress pricing yet, but in a year I think we will, and we'll be ready. So we are looking, that no, no stone goes unturned. We are watching everything. We've got a list of pursuits we're watching that is a mile long. Um, and some of those will fall by the wayside. Some will succeed, some will figure it out, some will go on and, and fail on their own. Um, but some, some will be priced, ready to go, and we'll be there. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It was amazing. Um, so I've walked through this development. It's beautiful, 7 million square feet. I'm just curious, um, what would you consider to be the smallest development to st to still be worth your time um, as such big developers? That's a great question. Be um, and, and I have an answer, but I'm surprised that you thought to ask that, <laughs> frankly, because people come forward all the time and say, this building, you should look at it. It's, you know, they probably own 5% of it or something and, and want Brookfield to come in and, and, and take over. Um, about 200,000 feet is, is our floor. Beyond that, we're expending the same amount of staff time and allocating the same amount of resources for a far smaller return. So great question, um, and, and one you should continue to ask yourself. And, and the answer to that is always going to switch, right? It's always going to change according to the company that you're working for and the resources they have and the expectations of return that they have. But for us, it's 200,000 feet. Hi, Sabrina. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you, between a project like Brookfield Place in Battery City Park and a project or projects like this uh, on near Hudson Yards, which differences or uh, similarities in the time frame and the type of uh, urban intervention did you realize uh, is happening between those 
days and these days uh, on those type of development? Yeah, so um, I love that comparison. And one, you know, obviously World Financial Center slash Brookfield Place was the beginning of my career, but it was built on landfill. So Manhattan, we're out of dirt, right? We're, and so creating real estate through landfill, which most of that landfill came from the excavation for World Trade Center, but some came from elsewhere. Um, that is a, a direct comparison to building a platform over an open cut to the railroads. We're creating land again. So fast forward decades later, that's exactly what we did. And I was actually, Olympia York owned the first parcel of Manhattan West, which was really mostly air over, over the railroad tracks um, in the 80s. So I was a young project manager in my steel toe boots and walking around, we lowered the catenaries waiting for a platform that didn't go in for 30 years, 35 years. Um, so I would say that's one interesting comparison and here we are still grappling with where do we build next, right? On the actual planning of those two, and, and again, remember World Financial Center, Brookfield Place, I was young. I was 24, 25, 26, so I was not in charge. I, I was a worker bee. I was out there, you know, seven in the morning to nine o'clock at night. Um, but we learned a lot from that project when 2013 came and Merrill Lynch, which had triple net lease on four million square feet in that project, went under. And we needed to reposition this project and allow it to, to lease up again in pretty short order or we were in big trouble. And what we saw was a real, a, a real study in how we build and how we use space from the 80s to, to the 2010s. Um, for instance, the, there was a lot of retail in, in the base of the building, and there still is, but it was all inward facing. It was all inward facing, and it all assumed that the shoppers were men. When you think back to World Financial Center and the Wall Street of the 80s, women were secretaries. There was no one in charge, and so the retail was all cigars and Brooks Brothers and, and so on. So we unpeeled the building, we turned everything around so it faced, it was New York retail. You walked in and out, you wanted to walk down the street and see something new and exciting and different every 10 feet, that's our retail. And we did the best we could to open the inside to the outside. And I, you see that now, um, with Manhattan West. And as a matter of fact, there it was almost, we had too little structure. It was wide open um, and trying to understand. We were working with city planning who was, wanted the, the central plaza to be as wide as it could possibly be. And we said, it's, it's too wide, it's too wide. And we ran around the city and stood in spaces to understand scale and what felt good and what felt too big, what felt personally comfortable and, and even could allow you to create little eddies where people could sit with the newspaper or sit with four of their friends. And as a matter of fact, we came to Columbia and with the Alley of Trees and went, mm, how big is this? This feels good, this feels good. And if you go to Manhattan West, you will see sort of a recreation of a Alley of Trees. We went to the seaport and how, how does this feel? We went to Channel Gardens, how does this feel? So uh, it's a very, personal experience and and only a person can solve that. You can't say, okay, it's gotta be 75 feet or it's gotta be 30 feet or it's gotta be, and people in leasing will tell you it, it must be, it must not be, but you, you need to, to test it. So I went all over the place there, but those two projects, those are, are some similarities and some differences. If you could grab a mic on Tank Madison. So I was just curious, aside from um, environmental sustainability, what is another key design element that you think um, adds the most value in the long term? 
great social public space. Absolutely, and you can put down a chair anywhere, someone will sit in it. And people like to be around people, and I think um, the key to it is, is offering enough different choices so that, as I just said, someone who wants to sit by themselves with their phone reading the paper in their coffee, or somebody who wants to sit with a bunch of their friends, have a glass of wine, or just laugh, um, provide programming. Um, even if it's putting some ping pong tables out or, or you know, blaring Motown every once in a while. Um, providing experiential opportunities. Um, and, and I think public art is also a great way to expand and enhance that um, and, and bring sort of a, a civic importance and, and yet permanence to public space. But great public places for people is essential today. for being here with us. Um, I just wanted to ask you, and um, you can answer it the best, like the, the, the way you want with the question because it has like many ways to be answered. So uh, I think the beautiful thing about um, development is that it's alive. Buildings are alive in itself, like they breathe. The materials in itself change. And my question to you is, as like the executive vice, vice president of Brookfield for development, how do you get to be like acknowledgeable of the buildings in itself, of the sites, of the people? And my, my question is, it, it can be answered, for example, like uh, how do you manage your time? Do you know how much you put into each project? Or it can also be answered about like what traits do you think are uh, important to be aware of everything and to know that finally the product in itself talks about one, no? About the company in itself. Yeah, so I would say for me, um, a lot of it is just listening to the project itself as it's developing. Um, there's something that will cue you um, somehow. An example, one Manhattan West, if you've seen the core does this, um, and that's purely a function of structure. So we put all foundations on the one place we had terra firma and cantilevered out so we didn't have to drop down between active train lines, um, which by the way, we were only allowed to work you know, for 15 minutes every other Sunday or something. It was ridiculous in the middle of the night. Um, so this was how, how we worked around that. But looking at it um, and working with the architects, they said, you know, it, there's such a strength there. We should put stone there and just really embrace the strength and really, really announce that strength. And then going to Italy, looking at the stone, and, and I had seen the travertine that you see there, and, um, and it was a great solution. Everybody loved it. But it was drawn so that the lines, each piece, the lines, none of them matched up. It's very difficult to do. And when we were there, I understood that the, man, the fabricator owned the quarry, so they could control the material they had. And convincing them, I said, it'd be great if you just made one line continue across the top, maybe one down at the bottom. It'll trick people's eye into thinking that this is one massive piece of stone. And, and the owner, and I love her to pieces, said, impossible, impossible, impossible. And <laughs> The guy who is, was running her plants said, so difficult, maybe not impossible. And I said, okay, I'm talking to him. So I come over <laughs> and we're talking away and he got excited, then she got excited. They matched up every single piece. Of, it, it is one bench all the way around. It's, she believes, he believes, the project of their lives, I believe one of the projects of my life. And the project to me is so much more beautiful because of that, but it was looking at it and being moved by something that you went a little further, a little further, everybody builds on it, and you get to the end. So, um, and, and that's at least one of the hooks for that building, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, 
question kind of about the technology investments that Brookfield has made. So um, I guess I know Brookfield kind of like was an early on investor with like BTS and then you mentioned Willow during your presentation just now. So do you think that these partnerships have really kind of set Brookfield apart and allowed you to achieve these ESG milestones that you've mentioned um, during your presentations early on? Like does that give your company a competitive advantage kind of thing? Mm. You know, I'm not sure. I think there are plenty of real estate companies out there that are investing in tech. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody who's on the side, you look at Tish and Sprout, I look at, at all of our true peers, they are, everybody is pushing the envelope in their own way and investing. Um, I think what really changes things and, and what really allows us to achieve milestones is the mindset. And the mindset at the top, the mindset all the way down and the embracing of the need to do that. Um, I think that's far more important. It's very easy to step away and say, okay, we'll, we'll go this far. Um, it takes real commitment and conviction to, to meet those milestones and, and meet those benchmarks. So. But it's important, everybody, and, and you have to try new things, otherwise they don't, they don't improve. Um, and new technology, getting to a place where it's actually viable and useful very iterative, so we do um, very often, and Willow is a good example, take a leap of faith and say we're gonna try something new towards the target of improving it. Mm -hmm. Hi Sabrina, thank you for your time today. Um, my question is, uh, you've talked about you know, no, no development projects really penciling out and the risk of adjusted returns not being really worth it right now. Um, how long, or what do you think will take for everyone to kind of start, right now it's like maybe a orange or a red light right now, for it to go back to a green light, like what do you think it would take, will it take for you guys to kind of adjust your appetite in terms of taking more risks? Or are you guys just all waiting for the interest rates to come down and maybe a year or two, or what's kind of the strategy that you guys are looking at and maybe at the market as a whole for all these developers start to really um, doing new construction? Yeah, well, I think um, probably what will happen first is that um, price of entry will, will fall, and then that's probably a year, maybe two, but I think in a year we'll start to see some of the opportunities I was referring to. Um, that's the first step. I think it's important to remember while interest rates are high right now, on a historical sta scale, they're not. They're still relatively low. Um, so feel that that will settle probably next. Um, on the construction side, the pricing and supply chain issues and, and the turmoil that we've seen is already settling out and we're seeing great improvement there. It's just sort of one-off problems that we deal with now. Um, so I, I have a feeling we'll be back to opportunistic returns um, within a year or two, or at least being back in a position where we're launching again and, and seeing green lights. So. Well, I have um, in closing just a few rapid fire questions. Um, reality TV news or docu-series? Oh, docu-series. <laughs> reality TV. Watching the news or docu-series? Docu-series. Canada or US? US. Bro Brookfield's Canadian company? Okay. <laughs> uh, date night theater or restaurant? Restaurant. Uh, hockey, soccer, or basketball? Hockey. New York? Oh, I, I should say basketball. My no. daughter played basketball. Okay. <laughs> you should probably shoot me for that, yeah. West Coast or East Coast? Love well, thank you for indulging, um, and thank you so much for sharing with us your stories and the analogy of sometimes a river is the bridge and the solution is pulling it apart. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you.